Meanwhile, let's have a, our next conversation, which is going to be on autism, the autism burden in the country, and just creating more awareness about autism. We are joined now by Professor Elizabeth Bukusi. She's been here many times before, Senior Principal Clinical Research Scientist at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, Camry. She's joined by Dr. Sylvia Muchabo Akisinku, who's a founder, and this speaks for special needs persons, Africa. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the hot seats of the Situation Room. Thank you. Prof, good to see you again. How are you? Happy New Year. We haven't met this year. Have, Imagine that. Have we? Oh, wow. <laughs> happy New Year. Well, I'm told that in Kenya you can say Happy New Year until it's August. Yes. <laughs> so, Happy New Year. That's why we're saying, we're saying Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy, happy New, New Year, Year to you. Good to see you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Sylvia Karibu Sana. Asante Sana. Welcome to the hot seat of the situation room. Is it as hot as it sounds? Uh, you tell us. <laughs> How is it? <laughs> I'm here to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You'll have us. Uh, uh, Delightful. Oh, wow. <laughs> <Moment. laughs> Magnificent. <laughs> <even>. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. <laughs> City will first welcome you with the day's proverb. Each week, City goes to one African country. He mines proverbs from that country. He selects a few. He brings us a proverb a day from that country. So your job is to listen to the proverb and give us your interpretation of the proverb. Okay? All right. City, let's go. This week, we are in the island republic of Mauritius. Rulers are like hills. When darkness falls, they all speak alike. Rulers are like hills. When darkness falls, they all speak alike. Who would like to go first? Professor Bukus, you've got They say good beauty experience. before age. So Dr. <laughs> <laughs> you just threw me under the bus, right? <laughs> right under the bus. Okay. I think we, we see this even here in Kenya so many at times. Mm. Um... I'm not a very political person, but I'm, I'm just trying to find a safe example. <laughs> we are very political here. So I know, we, I know, I know. Safe. Yes. Am I? I, I still have the outside to go and face. <laughs> don't, don't worry, we also live outside the studio. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give an example. Like uh, during uh, electioneering period, right? Yes. You see, everyone is talking about, and I will speak specifically about the topic that we are talking about today. Everyone will talk about being disability inclusive and making promises, you know. Yep. But watch out when they get to the top of that here, when they become the leaders. How much of implementation do we actually see? But all of them in unison, when they're asking for your votes, they will seek out and PWDs will be part of their topic. Mm -hmm. But implementation, when they're in their own sun, well, they're not part of it. Very well said. And here you say you are not political. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Prof, how do you interpret this one? You know, to me, it makes me think about um, the title of a book I read once, Who Are You When No One Is Looking? And I think when it's dark at night, when there's nobody seeing and maybe people aren't even listening, it's the authentic you that shows up. And that's the question we're asking. And I think when it comes to talking about people who are different, that's where we are. Who are we when nobody's looking, when nobody's hearing us, when there's nobody to take measure of what we're doing? Mm. Because that's the authentic us, uh, authentic us. And the question is, can we be authentic in terms of our inclusivity for these people who are special, who are different from the rest of us? Mm. Starting with a simple thing, like I always think about people who are left-handed. You know, the world is so right-handed that when you're left-handed, you start off by being challenged because even where you put your book when you're writing, when you're left-handed, is different yep. because the world hasn't made account for the fact that there are people who are right-handed and people who are left-handed. They expect you to use your right hand mm. to turn the handle, mm. to turn a tap. Well, mm -hmm. good ones, good ones. I want to start with you, Dr. Sylvia. Yeah. What is Andy Speaks for Special Needs Persons Africa? Andy Speaks is a social enterprise, a not-for-profit, that champions for inclusion of persons with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Uh, we're talking autism, ADHD, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, the ones that come about when they get affected, when development of your brain does not fully form mm. and it affects how you work, how you interact, your behavior, your social uh, engagements and the likes. So we are looking at the areas of education, social protection and health, key 
and we also at this point we've had a big influx of teens who now are looking at transition and they have nowhere to go so that's another big task up ahead of us mm. so we champion for inclusion and sit in many places looking at policy amends and also putting up programs uh, to support the community and this is because if i am allowed as a mother of three two of my children are on the autism spectrum so um Walking this journey is what advised how I ended up setting up Andy Speaks. But otherwise, I would be just like everyone else mm -hmm. until I walked the journey. And man, you'd be blind to what's happening exactly in everywhere else. Yes, Prof. What is autism? It's interesting you should ask me because I think Dr. Sylvia would be the person who should really answer that. Mm. I've walked this journey for a much shorter period than she has. For me, despite the fact that I'm a medical doctor and I'm a gynecologist, so the area I work in is a little different. We deliver the babies, but we pass them on, mm. the pediatrician and everyone else to take care of them. So for me, my awareness really uh, came about, I would say, like two and a half years ago, because I have a grandson who has been diagnosed to be on the autistic spectrum disorder. And it was him who really brought this awareness to me. And initially, because he's the firstborn in his particular family, his parents, this being their first child, they probably didn't even realize that he was different. Mm. He was struggling with sleep cycles, sleep wake up. He would wake up right in the middle of the night and be completely awake, completely. You can't convince him to go back to sleep. He's ready. Mm. He's ready for his day and he doesn't want to sleep. And he's the one who's really brought me to the space of being aware around the neurological differences that children develop. You learn it school as part of what you learn but you don't focus on it because it's one of the many different things that you're learning so children who are on the autistic spectrum disorder like many other neural uh, differences that children may have they perceive the world very differently they don't see the world the way we do mm. the times I've spent with my grandson he hears sounds that I normally don't hear when he suddenly covers his ears that's when I realize there's a plane flying overhead. Mm -hmm. For him, even the sound of a plane that n the majority of us don't even realize. It's not just noise. I think for him it's discomfort. Mm -hmm. When a, a, something as simple as um, a pump goes on to pump water, mm -hmm. he covers his ears because he can hear that sound. It's a sound that the rest of us don't even notice. It's just part of our everyday. And even how he feels and perceives textures are very different. Mm. So for me, he's the one who's brought home the reality of the fact that there are people who are very different. Mm. He's extremely intelligent. He picks up things. For example, you give him a board, he's four, and he'll put the numbers one to 10 very comfortably for you in line without you even asking him. He'll pick up colors and tell you certain things, but he'll only talk to you when he wants to. There are times he simply won't talk. His language was delayed, mm. and that's the way that eventually we're able to pick up the fact that he did have a challenge. I but see. now he has words and he's starting to build them up. You'll talk to him and you'll think he didn't understand. <laughs> then suddenly he'll have a whole sentence and you'll realize this child understands so much more than you even know. It's interesting that you've both used this term um, as being on the autism spectrum. Previously we would say someone has autism but why do you say it like that why do you say someone is on the autism spectrum disorder uh, because autism is actually a spectrum out of my two kids they're totally different humans whatever she says is nothing i have experienced so you meet one person on the spectrum you've only met one person there are no two people who are alike but you see we, uh, we what we have been shown is either either of the extremes mm. the very aspergers who are the ones who can speak the very bright ones the bill gates you know um if i was to give my side of mothering and experience mine started with uh convulsions is what presented itself first then delayed milestones not speaking not walking and um, 
My son is 13. He mm. still cannot hold a pen 100%, cannot mm. steal color within the walls, cannot write his name. He still says, if you ask him what's your name, he'll give you his brother's name because that's what he hears most. Mm. Uh, the brother introducing when you say, what's your name? So that's the perception of how he depicts words. He started speaking when he was five. He's still stuck on he can understand you, but he will only give you three sentences and there are days he will have what we call selective mutism where he can go a whole week without speaking so for me him being a teenager I'm a, are we teening are we autism what exactly right. are we dealing with you know mm. right here but if you look at his behavior he's not social he does not have what she was speaking about text sensory so you're either hyper or hypo mm. so which means you either hear little or hear too much of everything feel their textures you want to hold on to something then there are things we call steaming like in such situations he'll block his ears that those for steaming they will do a repetitive behavior mm -hmm. which is part of defining what autism is so there is like a four-part quadrant mm. where if you're being diagnosed you will look at so there is the sensory side there is the behavior there is the language differences because you see like there are those ones who repeat mm -hmm. like anything you say they can just repeat like a tape recorder then there is the repetitive actions the ones who walk on the tiptoes the ones who want to keep rocking mm -hmm. and then when it's too much then they react to comfort and get to a level of I'm okay when this my son will not if he comes here it's a new environment the first thing he will look for is a stick mm -hmm. because that that balances the equation for him and he mm -hmm. fidgets with it another child you will find everywhere they go they have to carry a certain toy mm -hmm. a certain blanket i'm sure you've seen it in movies when they're doing that mm -hmm. so there is the both extremes that and then the intellectual levels differ um the the youngest so mine is 13 and 12 the ones who are on the spectrum have comor different comorbid conditions so baby a has um autism and he has intellectual challenges, a bit of physical, and language mm. is a challenge. When you have baby B who's like 18 months younger, right now he, he didn't speak until later. And I was in denial for so long, so sometimes I feel guilty like I, mm. <laughs> I contributed to the delays. So when he got into a special school because they're handled by professionals in mm. that space. Mm. So now he can speak English, he can speak Swahili. He's the one now you're telling, please, please just be quiet. But he's very intelligent, but he, because he has ADD on top of autism and epilepsy, you're like, where do we place him to settle? Mm. Then the brother is very good in music, but mm. then finding a music school that can handle both autism and this talent in him, you know, it's, so it's, it's a very wide spectrum. So this is interesting. Be you say this because, okay, like if we're dealing with that, if we're dealing with um, any disease, any condition, most that their symptoms, if we're going to diagnose malaria, for example, some of the questions they will ask you, have you traveled to what, what, what? Those questions we normally answer. You have a fever above whatever, do you feel aches and pains? So those are symptoms and you know this is what we should then test for, right? But if you're looking across this spectrum, there's so many things that could contribute to this one diagnosis. Mm. Do we not have base points? One, two, three, four, five. That you can say, we present with one, two, three, and therefore, mm -hmm. you should then go and have a look further. Your question is really good, and I'm going to start, and then Dr. Sylvia will be able to fit this mm -hmm. in. I think that's where, in a sense, we start to go wrong, because we want it to be a neat mm -hmm. little box mm -hmm. that everything can fit in. It's more comfortable, isn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. but that is where the discomfort needs to happen, because it's not a neat little box, mm -hmm. and it's not going to fit. And it's, as we're saying, a spectrum. Okay. Yeah. Please add, Dr. Sylvia. Yes. So, like I've said you meet one person it's one person so you can't have like all of you need to fit in this box mm. so and uh, i also mentioned about having comorbid conditions so they can present depending on what shows first in a child comorbid conditions are the ones that coexist with autism mm. and you can even have over interlocking like it's very easy to confuse adhd and autism because they they share similarities mm -hmm. especially in the sensory part the hyperactivity or hyper and lack of attentiveness so you have to look at the, remember i mentioned the four quadrants even these quadrants have now sub items under them so if you're looking at language is it delayed is it repetitive is it selective right mm -hmm. are they speaking or not speaking and then you see when it comes to language it's very easy that you'll find a doctor going for oh let's check a cochlea let's have an operation yet this child can actually hear you it's just that either the brain is not ready or their mm. vocals or their muscles 
So you see that spectrum part of it. So it can be either or. Because even if you say go for speech and your behavior and you're not settled, if you take them for speech therapy, then they're not going to benefit from it because of the hyperactivity or mm. the hypo, you know, or lack of attentiveness. If they can't listen and take in what you're saying, then you can't move forward. Mm. So you have to look at all this. And then the sensory differences. If I hear too loud, uh, you need to change the environment. Remember when you're defining disability, it's, it's moved from a health angle to more of a humanitarian angle mm. and interaction with the environment. If that child walks yeah. into a room that's comfortable for them, you will not notice right because mm. they're in their safe zone but the minute you introduce them where the environment is either too much or too severe or there's something that is off for them even just an example of uh, someone uh, the world we, like we say is round but mm. we built buildings what we introduced things that heightened uh, disability for persons let's say who have uh, amputees etc so it's about interaction with the environment and being able to do things on your own that and limitation then, yes mm. you doctor so from my interactions with doctors, mm -hmm. I, I've gotten to understand that diagnosis is a process of elimination. Mm -hmm. So you come in and you're presenting with A, B, C, D, and the doctor will ask you a couple of questions like Kundu is saying. So have you traveled recently? Um, how long have you felt this? Mm -hmm. When you do this, do you feel the other? So how do you diagnose this spectrum? I mean, what, when, when a child is brought to you, what is it, what's the process of elimination that a doctor goes through by the time they realize that they are in the autistic spectrum and not, ADHD, and not, and not anything else? So it, uh, basically, is the, there is a tool that is used mostly in the DM5. It's called, that's called the DM5. And there is others. So that is the oldest, although it, uh, there is some debate on is it right. And then, of course, we are in Africa. We are not like the West. Mm -hmm. the, way, the things we have, the things we interact with are not the same. The sad reality in our country is we don't have a standardized saying that every doctor is using this. We only have three pediatric neurologists and they're the ones who are more uh, in the no, whole three, three developmental yeah three developmental and the ones who are supposed to be catching this. But then also if you look at the culture side of it where you expect the nurses who are doing the first post uh, like she said she'll deliver hand you over. Mm. The people who you're being handed over to have only interacted with all these disabilities very minutely, right? Yeah. I was told it's actually like a three, three classes when you're talking about disabilities. So how will you focus on unless you've specialized in it? So that's a gap in early intervention. Mm -hmm. Our cultural views of, if you say my boy is not talking, Nikijana, he'll talk later. They o always speak. You, <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? So what we are doing is we are excusing because of how we have seen it before mm. without knowing that it is an indicator that this child needs to be given preferential and close look something simple as jaundice something uh, uh, like uh, reflux mm. and gastro issues mm. those will be just be taken away like mtoto halali like she said the child was not sleeping when, exactly exactly like a karatasi <laughs> you know the small things you're told you didn't bump the child exactly well. they, did, are you sure you mm. so we, we overlook some of these nitty gritties and these are some of the contributing factors mm. that can indicate or even just the child did not cry how long and how much attention or how much follow-up do we do in our anti Antinatal, right? Postnatal. Mm. Postnatal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was 14 years ago. <laughs> it's been a long time, you know. Um, but then uh, I'll just give you a difference in my firstborn who's turning 18. Mm. And then the time difference between him and the next was like four years. Yeah. When, I was, when I, I was raising my second born, those things I did not notice. I did not notice that he was, uh, it was more of we're always in hospital, there is gastro issues, immediately there was jaundice, but he was born preterm. I'd never experienced that before. Mm. So that support also for parents of these are the things we are watching out for when yeah. we're going for the antenatal clinics. Mm -hmm. it, the, it's just, okay, do you know why they measure the circumference of a child's head? 
No one explains it to you. They just take and then they measure and then they write it down. But you see, that would be an indicator for something. Either things like hydrocephalus, you yeah, know. it should be growing at a certain exactly. size at, by a particular time. Yeah, but I've never known that oh, until okay. now when I got into advocacy for disability. Oh. Mm. That's when it made sense. And I was what? At that time, I'd already raised like three kids, you know. So our, our support system in the health sector and ensuring that all the medics are aware, especially those ones who are interacting with our children at the very early stages mm. needs to improve our systems our policies let us get them off the book and actually implement them as we're talking about autism and creating awareness on autism Ndu, yes you know the question that you asked earlier about diagnosis now, mm. now i want to push it now into okay so once you've already identified that this person is within the autism spectrum then what is there treatment mm. is there is there some sort of therapy that a child can go through can some things be improved? Is there anything like that? Start with you, Sylvia. All right. Yes, yes, there is. There is uh, interventions, as mm. we call them, uh, b- depending on... So first of all, after you get the diagnosis, there will be recommendations to get assessment with the different therapists. So if you have a uh, speech delay, there is the speech therapist, there's occupational therapist. Depending on behavior, we have behavior therapists. And then if there is any physical inclinations, you have to see a physiotherapist. And uh, if there is behavior issues also, d- depending on when, because we have a lot of of late diagnosis, uh, let's say when you're transiting into teenage and stuff like that, then you'll need a counseling psychologist at that point. And learners who have like ADHD, just teaching them how to also calm down, follow instructions, ATC in terms of behavior, mm. the same. And the challenge that we are having is the uh, access, and of course, that comes in tow with they are very expensive. Yeah, because most of the time you find the minute that the doctor tells you you need therapy, that's the first time you've ever had the, your child has autism, maybe most of the people, that's the first time they're ever hearing the word autism. So you're thrown in a daze. And I think we need to also mention that the caregivers have a process of having to deal with this heavy news because your life has just turned from being told you, you are anticipating a bouncing child and mm. everything uh, settled. Like, you know, some of us took insurance for education mm. and then mm. you cannot attend regular school. Our children cannot go to, a reg- to, to school the way you just say, oh, you're seven, let's go to school. They have to go through what we call education assessment for proper placement also. So every angle of their life ha- comes with um, how how they're able to interact and which is the best place for them to uh, continually stay and stay and gain their milestones. Because you see, even if delayed milestones are there, in their classes in a special school, while your children are learning A, B, C, D, my child has a class of how do I button up, how do I brush. Mm. Those are activities of daily living, the things you take for granted. Mm. I that 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 fine motor skill that you have automatic that your brain can coordinate it that you're able to do those things that require even a basic skill like eye hand coordination those are some of the things that the therapy now brings on board so that they're able to be independent mm. Mm. yeah but mm. the, i know the other question that comes is can you cure autism yep. most most people ask that the answer is you can the therapies help the, uh, the therapies that they go through helps them do better, be better, be more independent, and manage the condition. So uh, when you hear people talking about we can cure it, yet we don't even know the cause, of course, question that. Okay. Yes. I want to go back, and I know it seems like I'm harping on this a little bit, but even as we raise awareness about autism, those who have children, siblings, relatives, who have autism want to they still want to ask themselves Mm. or they still want the answer as to where this comes from we've heard so many things that there is acquired autism for example Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you may have been okay at birth but as you go along something then happens are there conditions through which you are pre-exposed to elements that could be on the spectrum is there something that happens during gestation? Is there something that happens while a mother is carrying this child that could expose this child? Is there something in the makeup, something in the DNA that has been pointed to? Because usually we deal with the issue, and I think that's why awareness is so important, that we deal with an issue, but something about knowing where it has come from or what may have caused it grounds us doesn't it 
because then well it does because then we're able to say okay well even if i couldn't have controlled it i have a little bit more understanding of it and so i'm able to handle it a little bit more you mentioned it being a social condition as well Mm -hmm. and the truth of it is it it is Mm -hmm. because the speech the way in which you educate this child is very very different Mm -hmm. from anything else so yes we want to put it in a box because we're human and we understand that there's a spectrum but are there things that have been pointed to scientifically that would then give reason as to why this child would be born differently or behaves differently or doesn't reach their milestones mm. from the way this other child would? Who wants to take it? I think Prof. Okay, we have a pediatrician <laughs> among us. We have a okay. pediatrician among so us. let's introduce the pediatrician. <laughs> the pediatrician who's joined the conversation is Reston Marima. She's a pediatrician and she's into this conversation. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to to have you here. Asante Sana for joining us. Thank you for having me and having us all. And then let's go straight into that question. Great, yeah. All right. So when a child comes is brought to you and you're sitting there with a the parent and you've gone through all these things, what do you then tell that parent? So, yeah. So mm-hmm. that's an excellent question and um do you absolutely right whenever at, you know, anyone is having any medical condition, there's always the question of where did this come from? <laughs> so autism is one of those that doesn't really have a good answer. Um, part of it is considered to be genetic, part of it is also non-genetic. But in terms of cause and effect, it's it's really not well known. Mm-hmm. Um, some studies have shown that um, twins uh, tend to have a higher tendency, so that's why sometimes it may run, you might have one child and then a second, and I think you've shared your example. Um, so that's why now it's thought of to have a bit of a genetic predisposition. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are also non-genetic factors that may have been considered to um, not necessarily cause an effect but to be associated with it. Um, Some may be certain maternal viral infections may be thought to have that certain maternal medications um, like if a mom is on anti-epileptic medicine being sure that it might not be one that puts um, the child at risk and so on. But the truth is we don't really know. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, like I think was shared by the speakers a little earlier, it's about screening early and identifying um, that the the child has that and Mm -hmm. being able to um, provide them with the support that they need so that they can, um, Mm -hmm. as the young people say, live their best lives. How early can you screen them? How early? So usually the the first things around autism, and and I think um, uh, Dr. Tari here also shared, that there are different things that make you think that, okay, this child might be falling behind on their milestones, right? So the speech milestones, um, where they're not able to speak, and I think you shared um, that your grandson has has that, where they're unable to speak, then sort of social interactions, they're not making eye contact, they're not responding to their name. So the sort of milestones a baby would usually have, where, Mm -hmm. you know, you look at them and you do coo and they coo back and everyone's happy then they start falling back um, on, on things like that. So those are the sorts of things where if it's picked early, it can give one that suspicion to say, okay, maybe this child is not hitting all their developmental milestones and they need now that formal assessment for that. Mm-hmm. Dr. Sylvia, at some point you talked about the second child who is in the autistic spectrum. Autism spectrum. Autism spectrum. And you said at some point you say maybe you were a bit late. What did you mean by that? Um, having the burden of one child on the spectrum is hard enough. Not that the telltale signs were not there, but I gave myself excuses. Excuses that they are always together because they were just 18 months apart. Mm. They're always together. He's not talking because the brother is not talking. Uh, he was, he walked earlier than the brother. But then when I went for diagnosis, they, the, the alarm was raised that we need to take a look at your other child. But deep down inside, I was, already hurting from the other diagnosis it's a process acceptance i will not lie to you is one of the hardest things that a parent has to i can say 13 years of doing it and there are days when things happen and i wish i could turn the clock but it is what it is and for him when it was i was told i was like no this is a because t- he see he's he on the spectrum mm. what he was having is not what the brother was having so according to me this was a typical child yes. and i wanted him to be a typical child so right. i put him in a typical school what hit me was he was stuck in baby class for like two years and so you can imagine guys are coming and going he's in the same class and mm. he ended up being like a giant in a class and that's where that was when i had my wake-up call during a sports day when they lined up and i'm like okay sylvia it's about time because i'd already been told mm. yeah and this we're talking about when he was nine but considering like 
the other predisposed things that come is also there is marital strain i had mm. to deal with the divorce restarting my life um there was a lot yeah. there's a lot that happens before <laughs> you just before you, you can you actually go through just, that yeah so you can find like baby a was on constant medicine that I, was so expensive to afford at the time so i had to be doing one meal a day so that the boys can eat this one is young they they're being put on the expensive nun and you can't afford it and the stress is too much you don't have there was just too much to handle that that delay now i looking back and knowing what i know about early intervention and why i do the advocacy that i do for early intervention is yes. i feel like the past three years with intense support the progress he has made i always ask myself what if what if so you what know? is it what do you advise people then the minute in your advocacy what what do you say for for caregivers yeah. mm. it's never what you expected but that's the the cards god has dealt you accept and love your child for who they are don't focus on the disability focus on what they're able to you know see the able in them empower them whatever interventions that you've been advised to i know they're expensive i feel that but just try the best right now i know at the national council where i sit at the board representing caregivers and neurodevelopmental disabilities we're putting in programs access those free uh interventions that are being put out but then, and Sylvia, yes yes Sylvia, <laughs> we're talking about kenya yes in its entire vastness yeah all right yeah so you sit in the board of the national council for persons, persons with disability, with disability yeah. right but there's somebody who is somewhere in a village yes and they have a child who has, has these delays these delays mm -hmm. all right their nearest health facility is far yes there's a cost just to going go and to taking the child there and then they're given this diagnosis and told so this is it and there's education take a child to school and the teacher is one in a classroom of 80 mm -hmm. and they have to deal so what what do we need to do because it's it's expensive it is very expensive it's expensive in very many ways mm -hmm. it takes a toll on you mm -hmm. mentally it takes a toll on you financially even and physically for very, and physically yes. and for very many people you simply cannot afford it i love my child but i cannot I afford, afford all these things you're saying yes and that that, that is part of the regrets because even i had to do the interventions with one child and put aside the other child mm -hmm. you know because i could only afford one on top of it with the comorbid condition of of uh um seizures having seizures as epilepsy there is daily meds that parents cannot that are not even some healthcare facilities don't have they're too expensive for you so i'm deciding are we eating or are we living because we need this medication to stay alive yeah. those are tough choices that us as caregivers have mm. to make now you're in the board mm -hmm. of the national council for persons with disability yes what are you doing at that level to push so that everybody has access now for at least we finally have a budget for autism and other developmental disabilities what we are working on right now is to ensure accessibility just what you said the we had engagements with the cog mm. and where we want to see that at least every county has a hospital that is one equipped and there is also their support that is the human resource because we are lacking in that i know the president had made a call back in 20 the former president uhuru kenyatta made a call for us to have more learners getting into the rehabilitation because the sad reality is kenya has be, has ratified uncrpds sdgs but let's call a spade a spade even in the disability space the neurodevelopmental disabilities are like second class that now with all the noise that is being made someone is listening so at the council we have the autism and developmental programs uh, uh, that has been set up mm. where we are looking at offering um, medical support in terms of access to healthcare and getting the medicine subsidized and uh, if possible for free the same way we have HIV meds TB meds mm. being subsidized so we are hoping we can get anticonvulsants we're hoping that diapers access can be there for caregivers whose um, children are still in diapers because we have people who are in diapers up to older age and yeah. it's very expensive mm. and we have also access to therapy mm. so we're, we're looking at because when we are at an outreach in Nyeri, the close they have one speech therapist in the region, not in the county, in the region. So officially we have twenty seven to fifty qualified. So the the ones who are in high school right now in KU they're waiting to graduate in December are already working.
Wow. They've not graduated. Mm. That's the level of demand that we have in the country. Mm. And, 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 and we're just trying to see how we can catch up and even make it accessible. Can you guess how much it costs for occupational therapy? I can. Per session? Occupational therapy. Per session. Yeah. Power. Session. Power. I cannot guess. I can't. So it ranges between 4500 to a government facility will cost you 1500 KNH is 1100 Kisa is the only cheap one that is 100 bob. So you find someone coming. I met someone who came from Joska. You're paying three, 3002 and four to pay 100 bob to access the service. Okay. That is the reality on the ground. You still have to do speech therapy, which, as I've said, we don't have the personnel. I remember the last session when I was agreeing to take the last one, I paid 7500 for the first session. The subsequent sessions will cost me around six, five, five, four thousand, five thousand. Minimum two thousand five hundred is the cheapest you will get. And you have medicine and food and everything else every other Kenyan is paying for. So is are people with disabilities poor or is just disability expensive? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they're looking at a lot of interventions here which are extremely expensive. Yeah. And yet, the mind still goes that there is a burden. It's a huge burden. Yeah. Um, do we find that there are more people who are coming and seeking care for problems which we previously, historically, have kept at home? That's the truth. That's yeah. You have a child who mm -hmm. is not like everybody else. You're keeping them at home. Mm -hmm. And from the glare of the public, because we don't want to be judged, you don't want to be yeah. deemed like you're a witch, it's the truth. It yeah. is. Um, and so, or, or that something happens to that child. Do we see that there is a move now from keeping them at home to seeking care or even seeking answers to what could possibly be going on with them? There is a bit of a movement, but in fact, part of the reason we are raising awareness is just that. So that people don't lock them in the house. Mm -hmm. So that they do not feel guilty about it. Mm. And I think one of the important things as well is that the caregivers also get support. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a difficult, difficult road. And that's why we are hoping to climb a mountain in the next few days. Because for me, climbing mountains is really difficult. And every time you do it, you ask yourself, why did I bring myself here? Mm. Because you get to those steps where... You're taking one step and you're wondering, okay, will I make the next step? Mm. And then the altitude hits you. Mm. And then it's cold. And then you don't feel like eating. Mm. And you haven't reached. And I think that's what caregivers of these special needs children feel like every day. Every day. Mm. And as I was listening to Dr. Sylvia, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult journey. Mm. As she described, 13 years on and... I think every day is a new day. Yeah. Where she's You're climbing new a new mountain every, every day. day. You wake up, every day. summit, mm -hmm. come back down tomorrow morning. Another one. Back there. Mm -hmm. What is your Everest every single day? Mm -hmm. Every day. Mm -hmm. when, when are you planning to climb the mountain and which mountain? So we're climbing Mount Kenya. Uh -huh. um, and we, we, I think we climb 28th, Thursday the 28th. And we'll come back down by 1st um, April in time for World Autism Day, mm -hmm. which is on April 2nd. Who's we? <laughs> Dr. Bukusi and myself. It's Dr. Bukusi and friends, okay. literally. So <laughs> we, we've been climbing mountains together for maybe like 20 years, give, give or take. Um, and then uh, I think your sons and some friends. So it's Dr. Bukusi and friends. Coming together for yes. this particular one. Yes. Yes. Okay, and, and of course, the, yes, we are partnering with uh, yeah. the East African, African Academy for Childhood yeah. um, Disability. Disability. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones who are doing a lot of the advocacy work, and they'll meet us at the bottom of the mountain when we're back. What do you want to see at the end of this? I think for me, it's a couple of things because just to your question, um, do about what 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 is needed. Number one, it's a long journey, but it's also a journey where the full burden can't be on the on the family mm -hmm. or in the parent, right? So they're sort of so. In my day job, part of what I do is health system strengthening and looking at it from a health system strengthening lens, then what are the things that we need to do? So there's the aspect of health financing. Mm -hmm. The county governments are doing some of that, but also now making sure that that financing also makes it to hospitals so that they're able to employ speech therapists, occupational therapists, and so on. Um, the other part is also around... Um, knowledge of the the healthcare workers and also of the of the of the families mm. so that like you're saying you don't hide children at home mm. but you sort of say it's okay if they can't yet speak they can get help or if they're falling behind a little bit behind on their milestones take them for help and so on and then um like 
at primary health care facilities, particularly with now um, primary health care integration, making sure that development screening, like even just the very rudimentary one, mm. is available and people know to say, okay, if a child is not yet speaking by three, they're behind. Mm -hmm. And how can I get them to that next level of help so that within the counties, partnering with um, what the efforts from the county government, because the uh, East African Academy has, you know, developed like screening tools, which they're modifying for our context and so on. They've invested quite a lot in training pediatricians at county levels so that we are now being able to build it as a system so that if you go for child welfare clinic, there's screening and someone can be recognized. And then there's a system where they, you know, they can be referred to the pediatrician and the group for like multidisciplinary support because it's it's too burdensome for a family member to carry on their own and i think this is where um you know we need to strengthen the public health sector to also be able to deliver that mm. is there a policy or framework at the ministry of health that talks about <laughs> these things that we i like the way all of you are turning there. <laughs> yeah. the <laughs> there are very many policies mm. we have I, I have guidelines i have very beautiful books in my shelf mm. but Truth yeah. be told, on the ground is a totally different. How dated are they? Well, some actually almost at expiry. When I was getting into this space, I remember going to first of all, who exactly is handling this? Yeah. The rounds I was given within the ministry before I could get to. Okay, there are these guys who deal with uh, disability and development. Go talk to them, and you ask for literature and projects were done, whatnot. Then I, there are a couple of books there, but. I've never heard of this. I don't even know. There was one on signs and symptoms and how to handle. And I'm like, I've never seen this. Yet another NGO will come and duplicate the same. Mm. We're wasting so much resources mm. uh, duplicating. There, if I'll just look at what we're talking about, parents being empowered enough to know and also to be able to support their children. Mm. Do you know how many parental guideline books I have been able to accumulate? But... Let me to go talk to Mama Mboga on ground because I, I also run, as, uh, and Andy speaks, we run every year. We do awareness. We ride for autism mm. across the country. And when you go on ground, people are not aware. Some have never even heard about it. The, what she was talking about um, in, in the grassroots, we are not there yet. Yet police is there. Are there. We have devolved the system. Yes. But are we doing it right to implement Kenya is very good. We people come we benchmark exactly on yeah. paper, but then let's let's just move it to the next. Under what directorate does this fall? Neurodevelopmental mm. disabilities in, in terms the Ministry of Health. Of health. Re remember in 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 the Ministry of Health the, okay. in, at, at the national level. At the national level. Under what directorate is it? Uh, it was there was special special something. What is it called? It's just under now disabilities there is an um, in, the, an, um, ministry of in the ministry of health and in the ministry of education special education do those two speak to one another i wish oh, so the answer is no okay <laughs> <laughs> i wish because you see the other thing mm. um just touching on when when at the council and i was asking this child in a school has been we have a lot of those cases being molested being mistreated yep. being mm -hmm. all the wrong things mm -hmm. who do you run to the minute you go to the police Oh, my, oh, they can't talk, then we can't take a statement. You're already written off, so the crime is gone. You go to the Ministry of Education, they'll just be relocated somewhere else. Have we sorted the problem? No, we have shifted it to another school because the person is still within the system. So can we call a spade a spade? Our children are equal to other kids. They deserve everything and every human right that every other human being is receiving. So why are they being treated as second-class citizens? When you write in the, um, in the bill for children and you say that children with disability should access free medical health care, yep. that is an example of the very many beautiful ones that we have. But when you go to the ground, my friend, I have had calls from parents in hospital telling me, Sylvia, send me medication. They don't have it and I can't afford it. So the new Children's Act says that children with disabilities will access free medical care. Exactly. Mm. So this is a point you actually even take to court. Yes. Absolutely. And say the state is not honoring there, exactly. what's in the law yes. and even the constitution and the rights mm -hmm. of children. Mm -hmm. But oh. who are you? Who will listen? Where uh, is the energy of You are uh, Dr. Sylvia, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You have so much to do. You've got to go back home and take care of your two boys. Mm -hmm. Dr. Marima, you say you help, you know, thinking about uh, improving health systems. In about a minute, just paint for us a picture of a properly working health system that would help Sylvia and, and get through this. 
Right, great. No, so, um, excellent question. So, um, the first starts at uh, early screening, right? So, at the child welfare clinic, can we recognize um, these these uh, disabilities or the potential for these disabilities? The second is, can we um, access, can we connect that child to um, the required package of care? So making sure that there's a multidisciplinary team available to that child, even if it's not at your most rudimentary health facility, but within the county, there are those facilities that are now built up to, to be resourced for, for, those, uh, for those special needs. And then being able to support diagnostics, like you're saying, sometimes these um, illnesses go together. So if mm. the child has seizures, making sure that they have access to all of that, and then being able to have the financing for that. Because um, primary health care integration, um, provides an opportunity mm -hmm. for us to be able to strengthen these systems because from the um, you know the first level of the health facility there's a hub or a mini hub and then there's a referral center so looking at it as a countywide system mm -hmm. and then having the implementation fr framework and the funds that support the counties to do that let money follow all these functions Absolutely. and everything that works. Ladies, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank so you. we are climbing Mount Kenya on the 20th 28th 28th going to pick Lenana. Why? All the best. Thank you. You've done much. it before. You'll do it again. See you when you come. Professor home. Elizabeth Bukusi is Senior Principal Clinical Research Scientist at Kemri. Uh, Dr. Weston Marima is a pediatrician and Dr. Sylvia Mochebo is uh, the founder of the Andy Speaks for Special Needs Persons Africa. They've been our guests. We've learned something new. Autism Spectrum Disorder and we need to create more awareness about this. This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day.